All right, guys, let's talk MSG. Now, MSG is probably one of the most controversial food additives out there, and it has been for a really long time. The truth about MSG is that it's everywhere and it's dangerous. MSG, monosodium glutamate. I'm a huge fan of it. Five brain-damaging neurotoxins that are found in popular foods. The second neurotoxin is monosodium glutamate, also known as MSG. And while you might have been told it's bad for you, science disagrees. So just goes to show you the effect of MSG on your nervous system because it actually damages your nerves. And part of why it is so controversial is that while the FDA does have it on its generally regarded as safe list, there technically have been some studies that raise concerns over neurotoxicity that can arise from MSG consumption. And so today I want to do a little bit of a deep dive on what exactly happens in the brain when you consume MSG and whether or not it actually is neurotoxic. So to start off with, what exactly is MSG? So MSG, or monosodium glutamate, is just one molecule of salt that is bound to glutamate, which is an amino acid. When it comes to the concern over MSG consumption, it's actually not the sodium part of MSG that is the concern, it is the glutamate part. Glutamate is an incredibly abundant molecule, both in our own body and in the foods that we eat. So you'll find glutamate in just about every single food that you would come across, at least in small quantities, but you'll find it in larger quantities in meats, cheeses, fermented foods, nuts, several vegetables such as tomatoes and mushrooms, nutritional yeast, basically anything that has a savory flavor will probably be high in glutamate. When it comes to the glutamate that is naturally occurring in foods, well, it is chemically indistinguishable from the glutamate that's found in MSG, and there's absolutely no difference in the way that our body metabolizes it. MSG was introduced to the US in the 1920s, and by the 1940s was a widely used food additive that you would find in many products. And nobody had really any concerns about MSG safety. There were no reports of ill effects from it until the 1960s when there was a boom in Chinese immigration. And because MSG is widely used in Chinese food and there were Chinese food restaurants popping up all over the place, the public image of MSG really started to decline because, well, it's the US, so racism. Case reports of people going to Chinese restaurants and becoming sick afterwards started to trickle into public discourse. Now, even though it is the stance of the FDA that MSG is safe, it still gets it's a bad rap and a lot of people do choose to avoid it. And I totally get that because a lot of people are not very trusting of government regulations because a lot of these recommendations are heavily influenced by food and agriculture lobbying. So it makes a lot of sense that a lot of people look at that safety label and don't want to take it at face value. So let's actually get into the research that's been done on MSG and its effects on the brain to see what science has to say about it. Outside of initial case reports of Chinese restaurant syndrome, the first actual study that launched the fear that MSG would destroy your health was this one. This is a paper from 1969 where MSG was injected directly into the the brains of infant mice, leading to weight gain, brain lesions, stunted skeletal growth, and female infertility. And this particular photo that shows the differences in weight between the mice that were treated and the mice that were not really had a huge impact on public opinion of MSG. And this photo still makes the rounds today, which drives a lot of the fear that MSG will cause weight gain. But looking at the method section of this paper, what they did is take between 0.5 and 4 milligrams of MSG per gram of body weight, and they injected it into the brains of these newborn mice. Now to put that into the context of humans, that would be the equivalent of injecting between one and a half tablespoons up to three quarters of a cup of MSG. And yeah, if you were to inject three quarters of a cup of MSG into my brain, I'm pretty sure I would have brain lesions too. And people often don't eat a tablespoon and a half of MSG in one setting, let alone three quarters of a cup in one setting. And they certainly would never inject it into their brain. And so really the results of this study are pretty irrelevant. But in reality, most people at the time, and certainly most people now, don't actually read the study to know that that's the context for these results. And this is a huge problem with the way that science is communicated back then and now. So the way this often works, especially in modern times, is that a health influencer will see a study that says something punchy like MSG causes brain lesions, infertility, and obesity. They don't read the method section either because it's behind a paywall or because they don't have the knowledge or the desire to. And then they tell their followers that studies show MSG leads to brain lesions, infertility, and obesity, and their followers trust that the influencer is reporting this information from a place of being informed, when they're really not. And even though these results were published in the 1960s, modern websites are still peddling the same fear. I think we can all agree that injecting MSG straight into your brain is probably a little bit much, but it doesn't answer the question of whether or not consuming MSG is going to carry the same risks. A primary fear that a lot of websites and influencers have about MSG is that glutamate is an excitotoxin. Avoid monosodium glutamate. So MSG is actually an excitotoxin that is actually linked to neurological diseases. Now here is a wellness influencer that describes how this works actually reasonably well. Here's what's happening inside your body with them. When you consume these excitotoxins, it can overstimulate the neurons in our brain. So it, it stimulates what is called N-methyldiaspartate, NMDA. Okay, and this ultimately what is happening is you're having this massive influx of calcium coming into a neuron, okay? 
This influx of calcium is going to trigger what's called a depolarization, and that triggers an action potential. So an action potential is the beginning of a nerve signal to do something, but an excitotoxin is basically stimulating a nerve response or a neuron response and an action potential for, well, lack of a better term, nothing. Now, additionally, when you have this process happen, you also have nitric oxide synthase, which is produced, okay, triggering more nitric oxide, which can be a free radical and can trigger some additional damage there too. So we have to be careful there. Now, the issue with this hypothesis is that concentrations of glutamate are very controlled in the brain. As I mentioned at the top, we actually eat quite a bit of glutamate in our everyday diet. So if our brain was actually that sensitive to changes in glutamate consumption, well, you'd probably see a whole hell of a lot more brain damage across the population. So how does this cascade that he's talking about actually happen? In reality, this cascade only really happens in specific situations. So that'd be things like ischemic stroke, head trauma, seizures, neurodegenerative disorders. So basically anytime that the brain is damaged, that is when you have this flood of glutamate that can cause neurons death. The idea that excess glutamate consumption would cause this same cascade was for a long time very theoretical. In order for this hypothesis to be proven, a few things need to be true. The first one is that dietary glutamate would have to cross the blood-brain barrier. So what that would mean is that the glutamate that you eat would actually have to be physically able to travel to the brain. Now, largely glutamate does not cross the blood-brain barrier. However, there are a couple of small brain regions, such as in the pituitary area, that don't really have a blood-brain barrier. And so theoretically, those regions of the brain could be susceptible. The second thing that would have to be demonstrated is that elevated blood levels of glutamate that we would assume somebody would have after eating MSG would have to result in brain stimulation or neuron damage. Up to this point, the studies that had been done were injecting MSG directly into the brain. So basically we have to prove that elevated blood levels would have to have the same effect as if you were to inject the MSG directly. And they did research into this in the 1970s. Based on numerous studies done in a variety of animals, the methods of MSG administration that result in the largest boosts in plasma glutamate concentrations are injection straight into the blood, no surprises, and rapidly consuming MSG in liquid form in a fasted state. Generally speaking, from the research that was done during this time, in order for brain lesions to be developed in rats, their plasma levels would have to jump between 30 and 50 fold. The lowest dose that resulted in brain lesions was 700 milligrams of MSG per kilogram of body weight. To put that into the context of a person, would have to inject two tablespoons of MSG directly into their blood. Interestingly, the research done in monkeys shows that they are a lot less sensitive to MSG. In order for a monkey to reach that 30-fold increase in plasma glutamate concentrations, they would have to consume a lot of MSG. So for our 155-pound person, that would be about a cup and a half of the MSG consumed on an empty stomach. And even at that 30-fold increase in plasma levels, there was no evidence of brain lesions. In fact, it required a 50-fold increase in plasma levels of glutamate in order to even see any small amount of pituitary stimulation. But all this is only relevant to MSG that's being either injected or downed on an empty stomach, which is not really how we consume MSG. So four studies that were done where MSG was added to food, what we see is that even really high levels of MSG consumption don't result in the same elevations in plasma glutamate and also don't result in brain lesions. So in the study, they fed pregnant, lactating, and infant mice MSG within their food formula. So to put this study back into the context of our 155-pound person, the amount of MSG that the mice were eating would be the equivalent of a human eating 5 to 15 cups of MSG per day. And even at that level, there was no evidence of brain damage or lesion development. So given that we know that primates at the very least are a lot less sensitive to MSG than rats are, we can probably assume that the amount of MSG that you would have to consume in order to see any brain damage effects would be so large that it would be pretty much impossible to accomplish. But again, that's all based on assumption because what I've covered so far has been animal studies. What about human studies? So in this study from 1996, researchers administered MSG in liquid form to fasted patients, which we know is gonna be more likely to cause a spike in plasma level than if they were eating it in food. And what they found is that despite the fact that there was an 11-fold increase in glutamate concentrations in the blood, the pituitary gland, which is the region of the brain that is probably going to be most sensitive to glutamate, was not stimulated. But again, that is MSG that's been administered through liquid in a fasted state, which nobody's going to do that. What happens when it's administered through food? In one study, they gave participants the equivalent of three quarters of a cup of MSG every day for six weeks. And in another one, they were giving participants about a quarter of a cup of MSG per day for 12 weeks. Neither of these studies showed any effects on the brain. The only side effects that was reported was nausea, which if I was eating three quarters of a cup of MSG a day, I would feel nauseous too. Now here is another study where they were administering MSG in the context of food. So here they observed an increase in plasma glutamate levels of 2.3 fold 
doubled with the ingestion of a 70 gram protein meal. When they added MSG to that meal, even at the highest level of MSG concentration, they only saw a 4.1 fold increase in plasma glutamate levels. Now this is all well below the 50 fold increase in plasma glutamate levels that was required to see any pituitary stimulation in primates. And lastly, here is a study that was done in 2000 where they gave participants meals with and without glutamate and they tracked glutamate concentrations. And as you can see from this graph, there's really hardly any difference between glutamate concentrations in plasma between meals with MSG and without. So what we know is that in humans, in the context in which we would normally eat MSG, so in meals, even at high levels of MSG consumption, blood levels of glutamate will not rise high enough in order to have any effect on the environment in the brain. And research aside, if you were to step back and just use a little bit of basic logic for a second, if MSG actually caused weight gain and infertility and brain lesions, wouldn't we see those issues popping up in regions of the world where MSG is a really, really common food additive? Wouldn't we have seen those issues coming up in the 1940s when this was a really ubiquitous ingredient in our food system and see rates of those issues decrease in the 1960s when we decided to vilify it? But we don't see any of that. So really, when it comes to MSG safety for brain health, it's been an open and shut case since the late 90s, early 2000s. So if you see a health influencer now talking about how MSG is an excitotoxin and fear mongering about the detrimental effects to the brain, just take that as a sign that they really don't know how to read research.